it clear from what Rabbi Akiva said what we're talking about today? Do you guys know what we're talking about? I heard sex. I heard porn. Someone say porn. Yeah? Someone said porn. I didn't hear Rabbi Akiva say porn. All right. Is it, is it okay if we use the word porn? Is that okay? We can use the word porn? Is that all right with you guys? Yeah? No one's answering. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I want one guy. So, uh, all right. I, well, let, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, who likes porn? Raise your hand if you like porn. <laughs> wow. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed at, at the honesty in here. Well, I got two hands up over there. Wow, I got so I got three or four guys. Alright, I got Okay, I got three or four guys who raised their hand. I got one guy who raised two hands. Very honest. Very honest. Um and I'm, I'm very impressed that you guys are able to talk about this in a, uh, in a mature way. I'm glad you guys are, be able, are able to be open about this. This is not something which is so easy to talk about. And uh, I'm uh, happy that uh, Rabbi Akiva asked me to come in and talk about this with you guys today. So uh, my name is Brad Salzman. I grew up in California. Anyone here from California? Was that a gang sign? I'm not in a gang, dude. What? I, I'm not in a gang. I don't know what that means. Uh, all right, so I got some hands for more hands for California than who like porn, but uh, and not the same hands. I'm not sure it's uh, that's indicative of anything. I lived in New York for about 20 years. I made Aliyah about two and a half years ago. Um, you guys should try it, maybe. Sometimes it's nice. It's nice here. Uh, I lived. I lived in a few different places. Uh, I lived, heard of Muncie. Lived in Muncie for a few years. Um, I'm guessing there's a few guys from New York here, right? A few guys from New York? Uh, and I worked at a place called uh, Yeshiva University for about four years in the Where? counseling center. YU? Anyone here ever heard of YU? Anyone going to YU next year? Raise your hands, please, if you're going to YU. Oh, this year? How does that work? Oh, like in a couple weeks? Wow, very exciting. All right, I worked at YU. I can put your hands down now, thank you. I worked at YU for about four and a half years in the counseling center. And the counseling center was opened for the students so they would have a place to come and talk about issues that they were having. Um, you know, so the regular things like depression, anxiety, OCD, you know, general Jewish, you know, being neurotic, you know, that kind of thing. One thing that I think that they didn't have in mind when they hired me for the job was that I was going to be meeting with a lot of guys who had issues with porn. Okay. Um, in fact, when I got there, I, I started meeting a lot of guys who had issues with porn. And they started coming in to tell me about this. And some of these guys had very major issues with porn. Uh, they said that it was keeping them up at night. They said that they couldn't have a regular relationship with girls, right? They couldn't date normally. Uh, they said that it was ruining their ability to study, right? It was, it was affecting their ability to concentrate. And what was even more troubling to me is that some of these guys were telling me their use of porn and masturbation had nothing to do with being horny, for lack of a better word, being, uh, I don't know how to put it nicely, sexually aroused, right? We would think, or I would think, I would have thought back then, people who are looking at porn, it's because it's, it's coming from some sexual place, a place of sexual desire. But what these guys were telling me was that it was actually coming from something totally different. They were looking at porn not just when they were in the mood, but when they were angry. They were looking at porn when they were tired. They were looking at porn when they were stressed out, before they had to write a paper or take a test, right? And what these guys soon were, were telling me was that porn was not about sex for them. It had become a way to cope with life. It had become a way for them to deal with stress. It had become a way for them to deal with anxiety, right? It had become a way for them to deal with anger, right? And that, that, that to me, was the weirdest one of all. I'm like, what does looking at porn and masturbating have to do with being angry? So anyway, when I went to talk to my superior people there, the people, the, the director of the counseling center and all that, they said to me, look, tell these guys porn is normal, masturbation is normal. Tell them not to be so from. Tell them, like, it's OK. It's all right. Don't worry about it. You know, don't make a big deal about it. And I remember thinking, that's not it at all. Like, you guys, you're totally missing the boat. And it happened to be I was like a generation younger than everyone else who worked there. Everyone else was, was about 20 years older than me. And I'm like, I don't think you guys understand what's going on. This generation is dealing with something that you guys never had to deal with. And that's completely true, right? You guys are basically the children of the internet. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. You guys all were born. Wait, how old, how old is everyone here? 18? 
19? So what is that? I'm not good at math. What, what, what year were you guys born? 98. 98, 97? Okay. So 97, 98, I think at that point everyone already had broadband internet, probably when you were born, right? I don't remember what year they got broadband, but in other words, when you guys were growing up, broadband internet was already normal. It was as normal as having, you know, milk in the fridge. It was, it was just part of life. Or having a phone, you know, or, or, or a TV or anything, right? Maybe not a TV, right? God forbid a TV. But a, a telephone, right? Everyone had a telephone. Broadband internet was normal for you guys. So when you guys learned about sex, right? I'm not talking about you guys. I'm about your generation learned about sex. There was never such a thing as sex without internet, right? And what that means is no such thing as sex without porn, okay? So we have a whole generation, actually at this point more than one generation, who've grown up with the idea of sex and porn are completely mixed and intertwined, okay? And I think people don't even necessarily realize what that means because for you guys, there was never such a thing as sex without porn. Those guys who I worked with at the counseling center, when I tell them about porn, they're thinking about porn the old days, right? So someone had a Playboy magazine or something like that, right? Porn of yesteryear is not like the porn of today. The porn of today is a completely different, it's a completely different thing. The porn back then was not what it is today. So how is it different? Let's talk a little bit about how it's different. Okay. Um, back then, first of all, if you wanted to get porn, you had to go to a different side of town, right? I'm saying you had to go someplace where they weren't going to know you, right? You didn't have it in your house. You had to go to like some, you know, sleazy part of town, or maybe, you know, you wait, in, go into a convenience store or something like that when there's no one around, right? You, you had to risk getting someone seeing you, okay? You had to pay money for it, right? I know the idea of having to pay money for porn seems crazy, right? Because free porn is everywhere now, right? Um, you had to pay for it. And of course, so, so those are the three things. There's one is accessibility was much harder. Affordability, you had to pay for it. And the third one is anonymity. You had to worry about being seen, right? You put those three things together, they call it the triple A engine. And, and internet pornography gives you all three. Accessibility, affordability, and anonymity. Now anyone in the world who has an internet connection can watch as much porn as they want, whatever flavor of pornography they want, for free, without anyone ever having to know. Right? So you had this perfect storm of technology making pornography into something that it never was in the past. No one had access before. Imagine they were handing out crack to everyone, okay? And it was in whatever your favorite flavor is. They had chocolate crack, right, and vanilla crack. And, you know, and, and um, I think more people might be addicted to crack, right? I've never tried crack. I've heard, I've heard it's very addictive, okay? Porn, I'm telling you, is the drug of today. And I know this idea of porn being a, a drug may seem kind of pretty far out, right? Because we have some, some views about porn, things that have been told to us by society, right? I think it's very interesting they asked me to speak during Hanukkah, and I'm actually very happy about that. Because uh, as I was uh, writing some notes for today, I was thinking, you know, Hanukkah is really about this whole struggle between the Jews and the Greeks, right? And between our traditional culture and this sort of Greek modern culture coming in and, and giving us new ideas. The fact that, you know, I asked, I asked you guys about porn, and, you know, a lot of guys are like, yeah, sure, I watch porn. Like, you know, what's the big deal, right? Shows how much we've been affected by this outside idea of, of what sexuality is supposed to be and about the, the sanctity and the, the holiness of sex. And it's really changed very much, okay? Uh, right, so let's, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, what is an addiction, okay? First of all, when I talk about porn, I'm not just talking about watching videos, okay? Um, as you guys know better than anybody, these days, people can, it's not just porn that people can access, it's also sex, right? You, people now, because on their smartphone, you have apps that you can use to find a sexual partner, you know, based on how close or how far you are. I know, uh, I don't know if uh, Rabbi Yudin's getting nervous as I'm describing this, I'm giving these guys ideas, but I guarantee you these guys know about it already. They don't need me to tell them. They, they know which apps I'm talking about, right? Um, okay, well, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so, let's, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what defines an addiction, right? How, could, how can porn, how could porn and sex actually be an addiction? So we said before, we said before, right? Porn and sex, they become, they become a drug because we use them as a way, like those guys I was talking about at YU, as a way to deal with our feelings, right? All of us have, have dealt with these feelings of being anxious, of being depressed, of being scared, of being nervous, of being angry, right? And 
it's hard to deal with these feelings. What happens is when we discover something at a young age can make us feel better really quick, like within minutes, all of a sudden we say, hey, you know what? I can handle life, right? Because, you know, I just got yelled at by my mom, right? Or I just flunked a test, right? Or I just got turned down for a job interview or whatever it is. Or this girl doesn't want to go out with me or I'm too shy to talk, whatever it is, right? And I can make myself feel better in seconds, in seconds, right? I can go online, I can go on my phone, right? Put in a couple of keywords and I'm, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. And that can make me feel better for a few minutes, for a few hours, right? So people develop this as a really, it seems like a great coping strategy, right? They don't even realize though that this is a coping strategy, right? They just think, hey, I look at porn, everyone looks at porn, it's out there, it's free, right? What's the big deal, right? I'm here to tell you that it is actually a bigger deal than we may think it is, and we may realize. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how porn can become addictive, right? First of all, just a, a tiny bit of science here, okay? Very interesting phenomenon that some researchers discovered called a supernormal stimulus. And this is an amazing idea. What they discovered is they can actually override the forces of nature by, by messing with the design. What do I mean? Scientists, they, they said, you know what, in, in nature, let's say birds, when they're sitting on their nest, right? They will sit on the eggs that are the biggest and the most colorful. Those are the ones that they will sit on the most, and they'll ignore the other ones, right? So what they did, what if we take some fake eggs, right? We paint them super bright colors and make them extra big. Let's see what happens. So they did that. They put it in the bird's nest, and the birds, sure enough, they sat on those eggs and, it, and let their other eggs die, right? So they basically were incubating the fake eggs because it, it over, overrode the natural stimulation. They took this even further, right? They said butterflies will mate with the most colorful mates. So what they do, they took butterflies out of cardboard and painted them to make them extra colorful. What happened? They found that the male butterflies, over time, were only mating with the cardboard butterflies and were not mating at all with the real butterflies. Does this sound a little bit like what happens with pornography and masturbation? You guys, you guys see the, the parallel here? Basically, what you're seeing when you're looking at these images is, so, is it's called a super normal stimulus. In other words, what you see on, on a pornographic video is so much bigger than real life. So going back to this idea of, remember we're talking about the super normal stimulus, right? There's such a thing, again, in science called the Coolidge effect. And what is that? Basically, you take a male rat, right? You put a female rat in a cage with him. He will mate with the female rat unt and, until he's satiated, and then he'll stop, right? He's not interested in mating with her anymore, right? You put another female rat in, and all of a sudden, he gets the urge again, and he'll mate with the second female rat, right? You can keep doing that until he will literally pass out from exhaustion, right? And again, this is exactly what we're seeing with pornography, right? When, when we have normal people who are in a, in a relationship, in a committed, healthy relationship, people have sex until they're satiated, until they're full, right? But what porn does is it overrides our natural circuitry, and we wind up getting addicted, to this, and we need this constant flow more and more and more. And I'm going to talk about why, uh, it, it, for a couple of reasons, right? One of the reasons is, is first of all, when you look at porn, you're, there, you have an unlimited assortment of women, right? In real life, most of you guys, God willing, are, are going to get married to one woman, and hopefully only one woman for the rest of your lives. Hopefully, you'll never have to get divorced or never have to find another woman, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that's what you guys are but that's, that's your goal, right, in life, right? To grow up and, and, and get married and start a family. When you have porn, you're talking about an unlimited assortment of women, right? In one night, you could have 100, 200, 300 women, one night. So imagine in a lifetime, what is that, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women? If you're used to watching that and you get used to thinking, I can have any woman I want, and I can have lots of women, and I can have all kinds of different types, right? I like this kind, I like that kind. How, how's that going to... How's that going to help you when you get married and you have now one woman that you're supposed to have sex with the rest of your life? You think that could be challenging a little bit? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, what else? What are some other things here? If you watch, if you get used to watching porn, also you're going to start thinking that all women look like porn stars, right? Because again, most people, and of course there's some people who like every type, most people are drawn to these really you know, the, the, the perfect body, the perfect, right? People don't become porn stars usually because they're kind of fat and pimply and, you know, and whatever, you know, I don't know what. They're, you know, they're, they're, their hair is thinning or whatever. I think people are drawn to these, you know, super, 
super hot women, right? So again, your expectations from watching porn are like, okay, great, so I'm gonna get married and I'm gonna have sex with, my wife will be a porn star, right? Because that's what most women look like, right? Because that's who you've been having sex with, right? If you're, if you're looking at porn over time, right? You've been having sex with these women in your mind who are perfect, right? Uh, what else? How it affects your perceptions, okay? If you're used to watching pornographic sex, right, the way that women are treated in pornography, again, is not real, right? In other words, if you watch porn, women are objectified in a way, they're, they're made to do things that they don't want to do, right? And by the way, I've noticed in my, in my practice, when I deal with guys who are like in their 20s, right, I've had guys come in and be like, and to be totally surprised, like, wait a minute, like, you know, when, when I'm having sex with my girlfriend, Right? She doesn't want to do X, Y, Z, and like when I when I watch when I watch porn, like that's how you do it. And I'm like, dude, that's not real life. And he was totally shocked. He's like, why? You know, he like he, he said, oh, he's asking his girlfriend, how do you want it? And she's like, what do you mean, how do I want it? Like I, you know, and 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 he was totally shocked. By the way, this is not as strange as it sounds. Again, this is if you're watching porn, right, and you're watching hours and hours and hours of porn, right, and this adds up over years, right? It's talking about you're basically you're watching training videos of what you think real life is going to be like, right? Of what real life, and, it, and it's not, and it, and, it, and it really messes you up. Another thing also, porn trains you to think that the other person is there for your pleasure, right? So what do you do now? You get married, right? And your wife isn't in the mood to have sex, right? Or maybe she's in Nita, right? Or who knows what, right? Maybe she had a baby and she's not feeling so sexy anymore. You know, she put on some weight, whatever. She doesn't want to have sex. Now what? It's like, well, this isn't supposed to happen, right? When I watch porn, I get sex when I want it, how I want it, as much as I want it, plus, right? So what do you mean you're not interested, right? Or she doesn't want to do something because maybe it's painful, right? You're like, women love that. By the way, I hear this, I hear this from mar my married clients. And by the way, my, my clients are not just Jews. They're not just from. I have plenty of non-Jewish clients as well. I, I, at this point, I, I uh, Skype with a lot of clients in America. I used to have a an office in Midtown Manhattan. I opened a place called the New York Sexual Addiction Center. Uh, and I saw people from all different walks of life. I saw people, I had a lot of celebrities in my practice, a lot of CEOs, uh, a lot of, I had one guy who had his own TV show, who you guys, you all know his name. I've had billionaires, I've had people who own professional sports teams. This is not just something for, for you know, weirdos or, or, this affects everybody, by the way, this affects everybody. I just, and so just recently I was talking to this guy's wife and uh, he's, I don't know, he's, he's like, he's in his 40s, right? He's in his 40s, married for, I don't know, about 15 years. And he's trying to get his wife to, to do something that he's seen in porn. And, and she's like, I don't want to do that. That hurts, right? And he's like, women love it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was like, you've been watching way too much porn, right? Because, again, it's going to affect your reality and your sense of what, what's real and what's normal, okay? Porn sex is often violent. It's often physically and verbally abusive and degrading to women. And again, I'm, I'm telling you now, in case no one's told you this, women don't like being talked to like that. If, if, you, if you think that you can talk like that to your wife and treat her like that, you're not going to stay married for long. Okay? A, a study recently was published in Time Magazine that showed that couples who watch pornography are twice as likely to get divorced. Okay? It actually also showed that women who watch pornography were three times as likely to get divorced. And this, this study just came out. Okay, so I, you know, I, I hope that you guys hear, hear what, you know, what I'm saying here. That it, it may seem like right now this is an innocent sort of pastime, right? <laughs> but I'm telling you that it's actually, it, it, it's actually very addictive and it, and it gets worse over time. Let, let's talk a little bit about addiction, right? So how do we define an addiction? An addiction is basically an unwanted behavior that you can't stop, right? When we think of addiction, we think of alcohol, right? We think of drugs, right? What, uh, what do you guys think? Let, let, let's, let's talk about alcohol for one second. Why, why is alcohol addictive? Anyone, anyone here have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, what? Okay, gets rid of your problems. Okay, that, well, that's why people like it, right? Isn't it what? physically addictive? It's physically addictive. What do you mean it's physically addictive? Okay, all right, so basically it affects your body over time in a way that you crave it, that you need it, right? Yes? It takes away your anxieties. Okay, it takes so away your anxiety. So, okay, so like he said, it's, it, it, this is why people like it and people get used to it, right? Why is 
al being an alcoholic, or why is it getting addicted to alcohol, why is it a bad thing? Why is it dangerous? Because alcohol is not good unless it's in moderation. Okay, alcohol is only good in moderation. Yeah? It's addiction. It's addiction, but what, what's so bad about that? Why is that, what? Yeah. Okay, so it can affect your liver over time. Very good. What else? You become reliant. You become reliant on it. You can't function without it. Yeah. Here's your judgment. If you're addicted to it, then you're drinking it like during at work. Okay, it, it starts to affect. Thank you. It impairs your judgment. It starts to affect every aspect of your life, right? Someone becomes dependent on it. They need it just to get through their day, okay? How about drunk driving, right? People start doing things that are really dangerous, right? How about people getting drunk and getting into bar fights, right? How about people getting drunk and, and risking their lives, right? How about drugs? Do you guys... Do you guys, what do you think about drug addiction? Do you guys think that drugs are addictive? What, are, what, are, what, what's, how about pot? What do you guys think about pot? Is pot addictive? Yes. yes. I hear yes, I hear no. Yes. I hear, I hear yes, no. All right, that, that's a whole separate conversation. We're not going to get into that. How about crystal meth? What do you guys think? Crystal meth? Okay, what's the bad thing about being addicted to cocaine or crystal meth? Any, any, just, a lot of money. costs a lot of money. What's that? It's a mental addiction and a physical addiction. Yes, and as as you said, it'll kill you. How how does being addicted? What's that? Okay, exactly. What happens with people who get addicted? Yes. What happens with people get addicted is over time, right? You develop tolerance, right? And you guys may have seen this yourselves. I, I hope not too much. If you start off drinking, let's say, if you, if people who drink over time, they after a while, the alcohol stops working, right? In other words, you need more and more alcohol or more and more drugs to feel the high, right? And again, I don't know if you guys know people like this. I know I know people like this when I was your age, guys who already by the time I graduated high school were smoking so much pot that they were smoking 10 times a day. And I, I, again, I hope no one in here has to deal with this issue, but they were smoking 10 times a day and they hardly got high. They, did, they didn't even feel it. They just needed it just to function normally, right? So. So in what ways is pornography like a drug, right? So, what, so one, thing, one thing pornography does and sex, they get you high, right? I talked about before, it, uh, it, it, changes, it changes your feeling, right? You have a huge boost in testosterone temporarily. You have a boost in uh, oxytocin, right, which is a, a hormone that makes you feel like relaxed, right? It's a hormone that we get from having an orgasm releases uh, a large amount of oxytocin, which is like, they call it the cuddle hormone, right? It makes us feel relaxed, it makes us feel connected, right? It, it raises our serotonin levels, right? And uh, you guys know about dopamine? You heard about dopamine? Dopamine is, is one of the main chemicals, one of the main neurotransmitters in our brain. Basically, when someone uses a drug, any drug, could be alcohol, could be cocaine, it floods the brain with dopamine, right? Dopamine is this feel-good reward chemical, right? So what happens is, when someone keeps on doing it, the, brain's, the brain normally makes its own dopamine. Over time, the brain's like, hey, all this dopamine's coming in, I don't need to make anymore, which is, the brain actually starts making less because you have all this dopamine coming in. So what happens, now you're not using the drug and the brain's like, hey, wait a minute, where's my dopamine? And that's when your brain starts getting really itchy and saying, hey, you know, and this is where people get withdrawal. You've seen people haven't had their coffee, right? And they're like, you know, they need their coffee, right? It, it, this also, same thing. If you're used to, if you're used to, you know, uh, having sex or masturbating or looking at porn, your brain is used to that, that flood of dopamine, that feel-good chemicals, you're going to keep on craving it and you need to get it, right? So you, okay? All right, so we talked about it, it gets you high, right? It numbs the pain, right? And by the way, different types of sexual behavior, you know, I, I, I deal with sexual addiction. It's not just porn. It's also people paying for sex. It's also meeting strangers for sex, right? Different things that different people do do different things. People usually who look at uh, porn and masturbate a lot, that's their main issue. They're looking to numb the pain, right? That usually has to do with some kind of childhood issues that were never dealt with. It has to, a lot of people, by the way, who have this issue had significant childhood trauma, right? Some people know right away what that means. They're like, oh yeah, for sure, like I was molested when I was a kid or, you know, or my dad used to beat the crap out of me or, you know, or, or you know, mom left home when I was, you know, those things are obvious. Other people, after they spend some time getting healthy, they realize that they had some other kind of trauma as a kid that, uh, that affected them, right? Okay, um, let's see here. So let's, let's talk about some of the other side effects that people uh, get when, when they become addicted or dependent on pornography or sex, right? There's something called 
Uh, P-I-E-D. Who knows what E-D is? Is there an ice cream truck? Should we stop and get ice cream? No? What, who knows what E-D is? Anyone know what E-D is? Yeah. Wow, that is amazing that everyone in this room knows what erectile dysfunction is. You know, I spoke to a urologist probably about 15 years ago about this idea of what they call porn-induced erectile dysfunction, which means people watch so much porn that over time they can't get an erection, right? And again, hopefully no one in here has this issue, but this is a huge issue among guys in their 20s. Huge issue. They, they have so dulled their senses by watching so much porn, they cannot get an erection. And by the way, I've seen this all the time in my practice, right? And even if they can get an, and, and if they, and even if they can get an erection for their, their, uh, for pornography, they may not be able to get one for their wife, right? Or they get an erection, but they can't keep the erection, right? Or they can, or they can have, an, they can start sex, but they can't finish it, right? I was talking to a urologist, I think it was maybe about 15 years ago. He said, this is ridiculous, no such thing, impossible. Now, 15 years later, all of a sudden, urologists are like, this is a real thing, right? All of a sudden, there are guys in their 20s, because it was never an issue. Guys couldn't get it up. There was never such a thing as guys in their 20s who had this issue, right? It, was a, it would affect men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, right? Now guys in their 20s are getting this, and, it, and it's happening a lot, okay? There was a movie that came out a couple years ago um, called Don John. Did anyone see that one? Yeah? Don John? Right? That was uh, with, uh, it was actually two Jews playing two Italian guys, right? Joseph Gordon-Levitt and uh, Scarlett Johansson, right? And they're both playing these, like, Italians. And uh, basically, like, he had this, this, this guy, he was, like, Mr. Cool, and he had this, like, super hot girlfriend. And even though he had, like, the hottest girlfriend in the world, he basically would wait till she'd fall asleep at night, sneak out into the room to look at pornography to masturbate, right? This is, is very real. This, this is not, uh, this is not a, um, just something in movies. This is very real. So, as, as I said before, when people get addicted to drugs, right, there's, over time, they need to you get more and more and more to get the same high. So let me ask you guys, what do you think? If someone, let's say, was hooked on pornography, what would, what would it happen? How, how would people escalate? In other words, we, one of the trademarks, or one of the hallmarks, rather, of addiction is this idea of escalation. Over time, people need more and more. What would that look like with pornography? Any ideas? Spending more time. Spending more and more time. What else? Spending more money. Spending more money, yeah. Not being able to get through the day without it. Okay, yes. Um, one thing that we see with, with escalation is that either the, the type of porn or the type of sex needs to change it, and it becomes more risky, right? More frequent or more intense? What are even more risky, right? People start, you know, if people are right now looking at the Victoria's Secret catalog or whatever, something like, you know, relatively, you know, vanilla, I guess you'd call it entry level, over time, I'm telling you that two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years down the road, it is not going to do anything for you, okay? I'm telling you that this is, this is what I see all the time. I've had a number of people, many, many, many people call me up and say, you know what? I am contacting men to have anonymous sex with them. I'm not gay. I have no idea what this is happening. I'm not interested in men, and I keep finding myself contacting men to have sex with men, right? And again, when I first started working this, I was like, something doesn't add up. But we actually see this is very normal. Over time, the normal, the normal type of sex, right, that people may be accessing on the internet, it's not enough to get you high. So you need to do something that's weirder and weirder. I don't want to freak you guys out. But there's definitely a lot of strange stuff that, again, the first time I saw this, even the second, the third, and fourth time, I was like, this is just weird. Over time, I'm like, oh yeah, you're, you're into, you know, trannies? That's, okay, yeah, sure. By the way, the most, common search term on, on one of the, the leading porn websites in the world, which I'm sure you guys all know. I'm not going to mention the name, but it's, it's maybe the biggest porn site in the whole world. The leading search term in 2015, and I'm sure it's true for 2016 as well. What? You know the answer to this? Uh, what's that? Yeah, go ahead and guess. No, no it's, it's, it's even stranger. I'm not going to make you guess. It has, it's actually, it's stepsister and stepmom were, were, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he got it, he got it. Badge of honor, he's got badge of honor here. This is the guy who raised, this is, this is the guy, this is the guy who raised two hands, okay. All right, I guess, I guess he had three hands, but he raised that one too, right? Don't, don't do it, don't do it. Uh, we don't want to see that one. Anyway, uh, right, so again, you know, for people who are not into this, it's like, it's like, wait a minute, porn of people having sex with their stepsisters and with their stepmoms, why is that appealing? Like, isn't that, isn't that pretty, like, messed up? Like, people, people want to have, 
people want to have sex with their with their stepmothers and their stepsisters? Isn't that incest? Right? Isn't that there's something right? Like, over time, over time, right? Like I said, sex with a normal you know partner, it becomes like the, what's the big deal? That doesn't that doesn't turn me on, right? That doesn't that doesn't do anything for me. I need something forbidden. I need something transgressive, right? And what could be more transgressive than having sex with your own family members, right? Right? Like I said, also this is the same reason why I see men getting interested in sex with men. Men getting interested in sex with children, right? A lot, a lot, of, a lot of stuff there, right? Interesting, interesting that that, that for you, uh, very interesting, right? And I, now, guys, thank you for being, uh, you know, yeah, open, open and sharing your, your. But I was saying, like, right, we hear sex with children. I was like, ew, sex with a stepsister, sex with a stepmother. Okay, maybe it's, you know, hey, I mean, it might be interesting, right? It's amazing how, how as a society, we've gotten used to these things. They've sort of penetrated. Penetrated. They've uh, they've uh, they've gotten they've gotten into our heads, right, and affected the way we think about sex. So I have a question for you guys, but not for you guys to answer out loud. Okay. So, do you? Is it possible that you might be addicted? When I spoke to Rabbi Kiva about speaking to you guys today, he said, Baruch Shem, no one in here is addicted to porn, right? And uh, right, it, you said that, right? Right, right. Okay. And, you know, I hope that you're right, but my money is on, unfortunately, it's probably not true, right? And I'm, 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 I'm saying that very nicely. I'm positive it's not true, right? And again, no, no, you know, this is not your line of work. This is my line of work, right? And just like, you know, a carpenter will come in here and say, oh, yeah, that, you know, that one, you know, which I can't do. I, I know this stuff, and I can tell you that I guarantee there are people in here, unfortunately, who are momish addicted, who are really struggling. And again, it's not because anyone here is, is any different than anybody else. This problem is everywhere, okay? This problem is everywhere. This is not, like I said, it's not a firm problem. This is not a Haredi problem. This is not a modern problem. This is not even a Jewish problem. This is, this is an everybody problem, okay? Right? And, I, and, I, and I, this is the challenge that I have for you, okay? If you think, so you may be hearing this now and be like, no, nah, not at all, like, you know, yeah, I use porn sometimes, but what's a big deal, right? I mean, like I said, everyone uses it, it's normal. And hey, I'm not married, right? I'm a from guy, I'm not married. Who am I supposed to be having sex with? I'm only doing this now until I get married, right? That's very easy. And by the way, I heard that all the time when I was at YU. I'm only doing this now because I'm not married. When I get married, I'll stop. And I'm telling you, it's not true. Why? Because it's not about sex. It's about dealing with life, right? Just like people who, people who uh, have a drinking problem, it's not because they're thirstier than anybody else, right? People who look at porn and, and use sex, it's not because they're hornier than anybody else, it's because they found a good way to deal with the difficulty of living life, right? And, and again, here's my challenge for you guys. If you think that you're not addicted to porn, I challenge you guys to go 90 days without looking at porn or masturbating, okay? 90 days, 90 days. Why do I pick, start why do I pick 90? The Gemara says 40. Okay, so I'd be happy with 42. I'd be happy with 42. Why do I say 90? Why do I say 90, right? Why do I say 90? Research shows that after 90 days, right, the brain actually resets itself, right? And I don't mean to say that someone is cured because as far as we know, real addictions, right? Not everyone who looks at, at porn, right, or masturbates has an addiction, for sure not, right? But for people who really are addicted, there is no cure, right? If someone's addicted, you can be sober, you, can, you don't have to get, you don't have to be active, acting out, right? But there's no cure. But after 90 days, what happens? The brain actually resets. People, all of a sudden, they start processing things very differently. So again, if you think that maybe you have a problem with this, right, and it's very easy, you know, I have a feeling if I were sitting there with you, you know, where you guys are sitting right now, in, in the year 2016, almost 2017, I'd be like, yeah, that's not me, right? That's not me. You know, I'm not, I'm not some kind of a weirdo. I'm not some kind of a pervert. I'm a normal guy. You know, this is, this is not my issue. And I really hope not, right? Because this is actually, when I tell people what I do, I say I'm a sex addiction therapist. Everyone's like, oh, that's, that's if I had an addiction, that'd be my favorite. I'd, I'd be that kind of addict. I'd, no, you don't. No, you, you don't want this one. You don't want this one. In fact, this is, this is in some ways the hardest of all the addictions to beat, right? People who have problems with alcohol and drugs, it's much, much easier to give up shooting heroin or smoking cigarettes or snorting cocaine or drinking alcohol than it is to give this up, right? And how do I know that? If you go to, let's say, a 12-step meeting for like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, you will find lots of people there who have 10, 15, 20, 25 years of sobriety. 
all the time, right? It's, 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 it's very normal. You go to a 12-step meeting for sex, Sexaholics Anonymous or Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, whatever, you will be lucky if you find one or two people who have more than a year or two, okay? I'm telling you, it is much, much harder. The reason is, why is that? Because they say that sex and food are the hardest addictions to beat. Because we need those, right? We need those things to survive, right? When it comes to drugs or alcohol, you never need those again, right? You may, you know, you may like to do it once in a while, but you don't need it, right? When it comes to food, try giving up food, right? And when it comes to sex, unless you want to become a monk, right, which is not really the Jewish way, right? Try incorporating healthy sex into your life when you have this problem. It's very, very hard. So, all right. So again, that that's that's my challenge for you guys. All right. So look. Oh, and, and one, one other thing I want to say, the, the thing I said before about, you know, I'm only doing this until I get married, right? Let me just tell you, when you get married, it doesn't get easier, okay? People think, oh, when I get married, so I'll have someone to talk to, I'll have a best friend, I'll have someone to be sexual with, I'll have someone to hold me, someone to cuddle with at night, someone to keep me warm. All those things, God willing, will be true, but they don't make your life easier, per se. Life is, Baruch Hashem, challenging. We have lots of challenges, lots of things that we struggle with. When we get married, it, that doesn't go away. In fact, in some ways it gets much harder, right? Because right now, all I have to worry about, I'm single, right? Uh, not me, right? This, this Single guys, right? Right now, all I have to worry about is making myself happy, right? Keeping myself feeling good, right? Now I'm married, now I have to make her happy, right? And I want to do something and she doesn't want to do it, what do we do? I, we got to work it out. That, that's, that's a pain in the ass. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that in base measures. That's a pain in the, in the bottom. It, it's challenging, it's a pain in the neck. It's a pain in the neck, all right? Marriage, Baruch Hashem, is a wonderful thing, but don't think that your life is going to get easier when you get married, okay? Because it, it just adds more challenges, and this whole thing that you've been telling yourself for years, I'm only doing this until I get married, trust me, you're going to have just as many problems, if not more, you're going to need this even more, okay? Uh, all right, so let me give you some quick ideas of what you should do if you think you might have a problem, okay? So first of all, Baruch Hashem, you guys have great rabbis here, right? And it, it seems to me, just in a little bit, that I've heard and I've seen you guys have a close kind of relationship. The fact that you guys can have a conversation like this, and your rabbis are in the room, and you guys feel like okay to talk about this stuff. Baruch Hashem, you're very lucky. You have rabbis that you can talk to about this. Find someone that you trust and, and that you feel you can be open with and share this with them. All right? If someone seriously has a problem with this, okay? And again, Again, this it, it you know it, it may be a hard thing to face, and you know what? For some guys, they may have to wait until they get married, and they realize, hey, I always thought I was going to stop, and now I can't stop, and now I'm hiding something from my wife, right? And now, and, and plus now I'm like it's escalating further and further, and I'm watching stuff that I never thought I'd be watching, right? Stuff that's crazy, stuff that may be even illegal, right? I mean, I, I could seriously, I could sit here and tell you guys stories for the next. We could stay here for the next 24 hours, and I would not run out of crazy stories to tell you guys about stuff that I've heard and this is this is normally unfortunate this is what happens okay if you seriously have a problem the best thing you can do is get therapy okay like I said a lot of this has to do with stuff that happened in your childhood right all of us are by design interested in sex that isn't what gets people hooked okay it isn't what gets people hooked people get hooked because like I said they they're looking for ways to deal with life with the struggles of life, right? And for them to get better, therapy is, is probably the best the best way to do it. Something else that helps a lot is 12-step groups. You know, I mentioned Sexaholics Anonymous or or some of the other 12-step groups for sex. It's it's also very helpful. It's like a spiritual approach. You know, it's, it's you know, you've seen in the movies, people sitting around a room being like, hi, I'm Bob and I'm an alcoholic. You know, everyone says, hi, Bob. You know, like that. <laughs> that, that, that actually works. I mean, not just mm -hmm. saying your name is Bob, but actually going to meetings and doing, it's, it's a spiritual approach, it's very helpful, and I think it goes really well with therapy. Okay, now as far as filters, I don't know what the Shiva's policy is on filters, I just, I, I gave a talk to rabbis, I think it was last week, or maybe it's two weeks ago, last week, it was last week, two weeks ago, and uh, I found out that uh, one of your crosstown rivals, I don't know if you guys are, Leva Torah, is that like, are you guys like, we are not rivals, you're not your no. buddies, one of your no, cross town buddies, Oh, Ration. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Okay. I, I don't know. Yeah, God forbid. We're all, we're all, right. Right. Asherania, right? Asherania. Right? We're all friends. Anyway, Leva Torah, Leva Torah, I discovered something fascinating when I, when, one of the rabbis from Leva Torah told me that they actually made it mandatory that everyone in the yeshiva has a filter on their phone, a specific filter they put on. And I was like, that is crazy. I can't believe you got the guys to agree to that. But I realize it's not about getting the guys to agree to it. It's the yeshiva deciding, you know what, this is a very serious problem. This is not 
And, and this is not just like, you know, we'll let the guys figure it out on their own. And I actually, th I, I ha my hat is off to, to them. I'm, I'm very impressed. I think it's a very big deal. I think it's really impressive. But let me tell you guys, if you think that you might have a problem with this, you need a filter. You absolutely need a filter. There's some really good filters available. Um, I recommend, there's, there's one for, if you have a laptop, um, there's one called Net Nanny, which is, uh, which is the one I recommend. If you have a smartphone, which I'm guessing most guys in here do, there's, uh, there's two. One's called Mobisip, M-O-B-I-C-I-P. And the other one is the one that's made in Israel, came out of Petoff Tikva called NetSpark Mobile, right? Which I've heard very good things too. And oh, actually, yeah. NetSpark is the one that Leif Atora is insisting that all their students, uh, you know, put on their phones. Um, you know, I'll take questions at the end. I've only just another couple of minutes here, okay? Also, if you're interested in learning more about this, there's a really excellent resource on the, on the web. Uh, there's a movement in America, it's called Fight the New Drug, right? It's called Fight the New Drug. Anybody heard about it? No. Nobody. Wow, wow. They have like over a million followers on, on Facebook. They're also on Twitter. Really good information, a lot of science-based stuff on how porn hurts, right? How porn, which something that we think is, is basically harmless, is actually, unfortunately, can be very harmful. All right, so I encourage you guys to check that out on the web, Fight the New Drug. Uh, you should all follow their, their feed. I think it's actually a great source. The last thing I'll say is there's a couple of apps that you guys can use. If you're trying to put days together, Right? Where you're trying to see how many days you can go without acting out, without looking at porn, without masturbating. There's some great apps that can count the days for you, and even more that can actually sort of give you some more like uh, analytics in terms of like, you know, when did you do it, what time of day, what was your mood like, what room were you in, what happened, stuff like that, which can give you more info data to understand when you're most likely to do it, right? And also there's other okay, so the, the two apps that I would recommend, one's called Fortify, which is uh, which is by come it's actually created by Fight the New Drug. It's free for guys under 20, I think. And it happens to be a really good app. They also have like videos there explaining more about how it becomes an addiction and how people can break free of it. Another one is called NoFap Companion, okay? All right, NoFap Companion. They're both, I think, very good apps that are worth downloading, okay? So that's the end of my presentation for today. I wanna open it up. Uh, I think we have a little less than 10 minutes. Thank you. And we have a little less than 10 minutes, I think, right, until Minka. Let's uh, open up to questions. Yeah, over here. So what do these filters do for your iPhone, like your smartphones? What are they, how do they work? Okay, so good question. So how do the filters work? So filter, basically what it does is you put it on your device, right, whether it's your smartphone, your laptop, or your iPad, whatever it is. What they do is you can set the settings, and hopefully it's not going to be you, all right, but it's going to be somebody else, somebody that you trust. You set the settings, as let's say block all porn, block all lingerie, all swimsuits, stuff like that, right? Whatever you decide that you need to block, right, and what makes sense, Someone else has a password, right? So then if you, if you go to one of those sites, it'll basically block you, right? It'll say, sorry, you can't get to the site. And it'll send an email to whoever, the person who has the password, right? So if it's a rabbi, if it's someone, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend just doing with the, someone your age. I recommend maybe doing with a rabbi or some other, someone like that who could be an accountability partner. And it's very, very helpful. Again, you know, it would be great if we didn't have the desire to go and do this thing. But the reality is, if I have this, if I have this, craving for one second. Oh, you know, I really like to look at porn. Great, right? I just looked at porn. Like I said, that, that never happened in the past. You need something that can get in between that momentary craving and the ability to just all of a sudden go on your phone, right? If you have a filter, now you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, right? I'm not saying that you won't be, it will be impossible to get to, but at least now you have something keeping you, sort of like a safeguard to keep you from getting there. You had a question. Yeah, I, like do the filters uh, block stuff, other stuff uh, besides porn, and then it kind of like gets in the way of things. Yeah, so a very good question. Does it happen with filters that sometimes you'll get sort of like a false positive? In other words, like you know um, something that's really not pornographic or problematic. Yeah, like will get like blocked. those like illegal websites to watch like 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 stuff like sporting events and movies and stuff like that. Right, right, absolutely. Blocked, yeah. So the the answer is yes, yes. When you put on a filter, there will need to be some like tweaking because you, there will get uh, there will be some times where you get some false positives. It will block you. Like I had a, a client who uh, he like he couldn't get the New York Times because there was some story there, and he was like, "This is crazy." And I, and I said, "Look, you gotta like realize this is sort of a work in progress, right? It 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 may need tweaking. That's why you need to have the other person with the password that can adjust certain settings until you get the feel of it. But on the whole, it's I, I believe that it's worth the the temporary inconvenience to be blocked from this problematic stuff. Did you have a question? Was the answer? Who else has a question? Yeah. Uh, what about these apps that you're talking about, like the 
the the well, fortify one and, and the no fat companion. Like how often do you do it? Some right. So the, basically, those are just the, the okay. So the question was what the, the apps on your phone that help people to to stay sober, to stay away from this stuff. Basically, you check it in with it. Like, shh, guys, uh, please just be quiet so he, uh, he can get an answer to his question. Right. Um, basically, you check in like once a day. You know, I'm saying like at the end of the day, it basically asks you, you know, did you did you have, you know, what happened today? I, in, in Fortify, it says like, you know, was it a victory or a setback, right? In other words, did you have a day where you didn't look at porn and masturbate or did you have a day where you did? And then if you click on setback, then it's when it asks you, okay, what time was it? What mood were you in? What, where were you? You know, all these kind of things. And then, like I said, it, it presents, it, it, can, it uh, compiles all the data and shows you over time what kind of situations are more likely to uh, cause this problem or to you know result in this problem, okay? Uh, yes. Good question. It's not that you said um, uh, guys that have had like a difficult or traumatic experience as children are more likely to be victims or addicted, whatever it is. But yes. That's not only obviously, right? Um, well, okay. So right. Those sort of okay. So all right. Uh, so the question was. I said before, there's a strong link to childhood trauma with people who get addicted, right? So the question is, does that mean that everyone who has this addiction had some kind of childhood trauma? The answer is, it, it certainly doesn't have to be, right? And, and certainly something like this, as I mentioned, there's something about internet pornography which is inherently addictive, right? The same way that uh, they found that, that uh, fast food is actually that food scientists actually are able to manipulate the food, right, to make it so that it overwhelms our natural feeling full, right? We could, you know, we feel like we were totally full, but you know, McDonald's French fries, like, oh, you know, I have room for that, right? We know that if we put enough fat and enough sugar and enough salt, right, and enough whatever into food, that it's going to override natural things. So the same thing with, with the pornography. So the answer is, yes, there is this again this idea of a supernormal stimulus, and people can get hooked because they have a natural drive. But most often, when people hit a real addiction, it is it has a lot to do with unresolved childhood trauma. Okay. Maybe it's uh, trauma they didn't even, they're not going to wear it. Oh, 100%. Right, 100%. They a lot of times. find out later they, when they have therapy. 100%. A lot of times they're not aware. I'm not, like, I had some guy, I remember he came in to see me, and he was like, you know, I'm telling him about childhood trauma. He's like, I had an amazing childhood. Like, in fact, my mom and dad never fought once my whole life. And I was like, like is that even possible? That seems really <laughs> weird, right? It turns out his mom and his dad slept in two different bedrooms and had nothing to do with each other, right? So as you can imagine, Right? That also is, is pretty traumatic, right? I'm saying it's not trauma like, you know, in your face, but it's, it's like you grow up seeing mom and dad, there was no love there, no affection, no connection whatsoever, right? I'm saying that also will affect someone and, and, and can really mess someone up and leave them with some serious issues. Yeah? What about like divorce rates? <clears throat> uh, divorce rates. <clears throat> Say again? Like the, when the parents are divorced. In other words, you're saying if parents are divorced, are the children of divorce more likely to get addicted? Yeah. I don't have a statistic on that, but I would say absolutely yes, without reservation. Again, because no matter no matter what happened, no matter how great you know the divorce was, how amicable it was, right? It still messes a kid up, right? And I and some people may argue with me about that. No, it it a hundred percent messes you up in a very deep way. You know what I'm saying? Just like you know, surviving you know some kind of a tragedy does. It messes you up, you know. And uh, and yeah, so that's gonna make it easier for someone to, to get hooked with, you know, in some kind of addiction. Okay, this is the last last question, and then I guess we'll wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, stopping yourself from watching porn doesn't necessarily stop yourself from masturbating. So, was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> wait, I'm sorry, wait, wait. Shh. Guys, guys, the last, last, quest, last question. Guys, guys, can so I just... How do you fix that problem? So you're saying not looking at porn, okay, if someone gives up porn, you're saying it may not necessarily stop masturbating. Okay, well, I, you know, I think it's very interesting you say that, because I think, again, going back to my generation or the generation that's older than me, porn and masturbation were not necessarily linked at all. I think today, like, I, I, I had a client recently, a guy here who lives in town, and he was uh, in his 30s, and I, you know, I said, do you ever masturbate without looking at porn? He was like, what? Like, who, who would do something? Like, like, like what sense does that make? Of course, they, but the two are one and the same. So, I mean, it's a good question. I think that today, because porn is so prevalent, a lot of times they're linked together, they, but really they are separate. And sometimes, interestingly, I've had many clients who are able to give up the, the, the masturbation before they give up the porn. In other words, they can even, they're not even masturbating anymore, but they're still drawn to look at the porn because of the way it makes them feel. So uh, they are two separate things. They're obviously related. Someone needs help to get through 
you know, both of them. You know, so they are they are separate, but they're also together. Okay, um, that, that that's it for today. Okay, if you guys have any other questions, thanks for having me. Last thing, great. Guys, I, I passed out a piece of paper with my with my uh, phone number and my email address. If you have any questions, don't uh, don't hesitate to be in touch with me. Okay, I do. Uh, I have a little center in Mount Bay Chemish. We do individual and group therapy. We uh, in person and Skype. All right, so please feel free to be in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.